Hey everyone, Duke Nuka 3D here. And I have a knife. And we're going to review the, the um, we're going to talk about the development and timeline of the M7 to the C15R1 carrier for combat service masks, quote unquote. In the middle here we have the ugly bastard child that everyone hates. We'll get to that in a moment. But first of all, we're going to talk about where the carrier design got its origins and how it developed. So it goes without saying that the M7 style carrier was patterned um, sometime, again, I probably should have looked more at the wiki before referencing this, but the original design, the E7 carrier, was finalized sometime in the early to, mid, I'd say around the early to late 19, like 1943 or so. Again, I'm sort of fumbling over my words because it's a co-op review and we're kind of crunched on time, but um, the carrier had later on been developed or up updated as the E7R1, which would later become known as the M7 carrier, but as I've stated in my M5 combat service mask reviews, that the M7 style carrier and the combat service mask designation did not come to full fruition until June 7th of 1944, which was when the, M the E637 Army assault gas mask replaced its E7 carrier with the E7R1, obviously being designated as the M7 here. And then Sometime along that time, sometime in the nineteen four, like the late forties or so, let's say between nineteen forty four and nineteen forty five, we were working on the E nineteen series prototype combat service masks, which were basically what would become the M nine. And one of two of the carriers that were trialed during that period, alongside the MIT E nineteen R two and the MIT E twenty carriers, was the normal M7 and what was dubbed as the M7A carrier, if you'd like to fill us in about that, Moolash. Yeah. So the M7A carrier is a spectacular piece of bullshit. Uh, more specifically, they experimented with a couple things with it. Um, one of those was, as you can see, taking all the straps off and replacing them with grommet holes. It has grommet holes on the bottom, they're identical. Mine did not come with those straps, unfortunately. It, it's really hard to find them with the straps for some reason. Of all, like, of the three examples that I've seen of these weird experimental carriers, I've only seen, like, None with any of the straps present, so we're gonna have to fabricate those later on. Yeah. Now, otherwise, it's uh, actually in very decent shape. The logo is very good. Um, you can see the buckles are all decent. There's only a little bit of paint missing on two of these. That's pretty typical, though. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they come out really nice. This one did. Now, the thing that sucks about this is you can kind of see this one's really shiny and this one's not. And I'm gonna stop waving the knife around. Is um, they actually tried to make this less reflective? Unfortunately, by making it less re less reflective and less shiny. They made it more tacky. So between the bizarre strap system and the fact that it's more tacky, everyone hated the shit out of these things. And they got really, really low reviews because they were just impossible to work with. Yet you had all the bulk of the first carrier, but then it's even harder to work with and, and less uh, less compatible with whatever you're trying to do. Despite this, though, they, the government testing the E-19 series prototypes, more specifically the E-19R25 trials of March 1945, realized that the M7 pattern carrier was superior. However, they had the issue of not only the M7A being more tacky and the straps being a bitch to work with, um, they realized they needed to have that ability to not be reflective, um, and they soon realized that after abusing the carriers in the field for a while, this outer rubberized coating would start to nick and wear away. You can actually see some nicks on my carrier here and there. I'm not sure if this in indicates that it was used, but they're nicks and small surface scuffs nonetheless, which is very common with the um, Butyl M7 carriers. So later on, when the uh, the C19 series was finalized from the last pattern, the C19R49, as the C48R1 face piece for the M9 gas mask, later to become the M9 field protective mask. Yes, I know you're probably fucking scratching your head in stupor at the moment, but they basically what they did was they took the M7 carrier pattern and they came out with this. The C15R1 carrier, also known as the M7A1. And I should go on a limb and say, this is an M7A1. The only reason this is called the M7A is because they were looking for a way to differentiate it from the M7 during trials, which is really stupid, but you get the point. But uh, if you want to add anything about the C15R1. Yeah, a couple of things. You'll notice they actually changed the, uh, the lifted out style slightly on it. Um, and these are actually fairly well built. They're not quite as good as the M9A1 carriers that came after them. The M11 carrier, to be M11. exact. Yes. And as you can see, the 
exterior of the carrier is entirely duck canvas material, which is rubberized on the inside, which I'll show off in a moment when we open up these carriers. And an interesting detail about the M7 style carriers is that lower wing, and they call them wings specifically in manuals, because as you can see, this lower strap here has the buckle, normally as it's facing this way, when the, when the wing is down, this buckle is facing in towards you, and it should not be like that. And the manual specifies that when wearing this carrier at the side, this wing would be folded up, so that way the strap is inverted and the buckle is facing out, which is entirely bullshit, but you kind of need to do it that way in order so that this wing isn't taking up most of the space on your torso. It's still an ungainly large carrier, but it's at least somewhat more manageable with that wing folded up. And we think that's largely due to them trying to deal with having the bag waterproof, but also having straps on it. Because every time you sew something onto another waterproof item, you're effectively punching a bunch of tiny holes, and this was their attempt to mitigate damage to the waterproof layer. Yeah. Um, and just to give a close-up of the M7 the M7A material, you can see that the M7 is made out of this very luxurious butyl-coated duck canvas material, whereas the M7A is a much thinner material, possibly nylon, not, probably not. It's more than likely just a very thin canvas, and it's coated with a less reflective butyl. I assume it's butyl. The references state that it's butyl, but the interesting thing, is, as you can see, is very non-reflective as you can tell and the texture is very very uh not rough but obviously much more tacky and that made enough of a difference to uh, affect the donning times of the mask and it actually feels very much like cheap tarp material like a pool toy almost like it's like it's very vinyl like in its feel and it just feels like i'm going to tear this thing when i open it for reference also both of these have been extensively washed carefully and coated with silicone spray so it's not a difference in cleaning methods or that this one has a coating of dust on it. This one's very clean. They're yeah, they're, very they've clean. been cleaned top to bottom, inside and out. And I thought I'd give a referential view of the inside of the carriers, starting with the M7. Opening the three flaps, you have the rolled gusset here, which is probably the worst design ever, in my opinion. And you can see it amply fits a M7 combat service mask, which I'm still not done restoring, but I will be soon, because I'm actually getting my rivet press restored, or, or modified currently. And you can see there's a small pocket up there for the anti-dimming cloth. And back there is where you would store your anti-gas eye shields, your two prote individual protective covers, and potentially a M4 or M5 protective ointment set. And that's all you need to see but there. Only if you're a fucking nerd, because no one does that, because it doesn't fit. It just explodes when you open the kit. Yeah, basically. Uh, speaking of exploding when you open the kit, see if I can... Is that a good angle for that? Yeah, it's a good enough angle. All right. Um, so you can see here... Uh, Actually, you, you should probably take it from that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, basically the same in terms of the interior. I did read that in references they did slightly enlarge it. I don't know if that's true. That could just be be, uh, be me misinterpreting something. But as you can see, it's basically the same layout inside, only it's just a non-reflective butyl, which is kind of a stupid choice because I could have just as easily used the original non-reflective uh, butyl, which was much smoother, um, and lined the inside with that. But uh, unfortunately, they decided that wasn't going to be the case. And as you can see, as a placeholder... I have a, um, for the C19R20, or the E19R25, I have um, retro respirators, uh, E, I mean not E, uh, C48R1 Black Butyl M9 face piece. It's basically the same thing, and as you can see, I'm almost done restoring it. Again, all I have to do is that harness, and it's uh, basically done. Also, something I didn't mention about this is, this is the same um, mask that's featured on Bart Wilkes' page, on page USA3. Uh, the one that's labeled as E48, but in fact is a C48R1. Anyways, enough about that. And finally, we come to the uh, C15R1 carrier, because which had a reasonably short, which had definitely short life uh, when used by the army. Because as soon as the M9, uh, the M9 gas mask was adopted, changes to the designation system took place, where the face piece was no longer, or let's, let's say. Between 19, December 1947 and 1951 or so, the face piece was designated C48R1, whereas the carrier and the filter had different designations. But after 1951, the Army adopted the M9A1 field protective mask, which effectively changed the face piece name to M9. The carrier um, also, I mean, obviously had a different designation, but both the mask and the entire kit were named the same thing. And the filter fell out, but that's fine. Eat. So... Essentially, inside, it's nothing really special to see. Again, the same layout as an M7 or M7A, only that there is a uh, rubberized coating of green rubber, 
and you can see that the only new addition that they have added is a large pocket along the back, potentially again for the um, anti-gas uh, eye shields, the uh, individual protective covers, and anti uh, gas protective ointments. Uh, this is th this is them realizing that hey, when you open these carriers, all that shit's gonna fall out. So they added a pocket back there for all that. So that's I guess one improvement they made. So this is really the peak of what the carrier could be. And as you can see, it's stamped C15R1 there. But as I mentioned, when the Army adopted the M9A1 in 1951 or so and began replacing it by 1952, they stopped using the C15R1 carriers entirely. And from that from 1951 onwards, only the United States Marine Corps used the M, the original M9 with the C-15R1 here, which they presumably designated the M7A1. And I know this is called the M7A, but again, that's just a a term that was coined to differentiate the two carriers from M7 and M7A, whereas this is the true M7A1, and all facts logical. If you're confused, please direct your angry letters to MIT, because this is all their, this is literally all MIT's fault. Yeah, this is basically just MIT being overly being a bunch of fucking nerds. Yeah, basically. So that's essentially it. All there is to see. I hope we covered everything. And uh, thanks again for Moulage to bringing his M7A carrier over to review alongside these because we really don't have a lot of these to review. And this is probably the first time one of these has been seen on YouTube. And the, the smorgasbord of masks here is definitely not to be understated uh, between the basically completely redone M5 that Duke has on the far left to the uh the fact that we actually have one of not only retro respirators but uh bart wilkes's really really rare masks here like this is the only like like i mentioned before in the original review this is like the only one we know of outside of the fort leonard wood archives so uh yeah that's basically it uh, if you have any comments questions questions or concerns drop them down in the comments below and we'll see you all later